video lecture number 12 coming up. Notice that we're in the Navigable Lecture Part 2, and I'm going to pop us up to full screen here. Note also that we are still in the Renaissance with number 12. 12, incidentally, is going to be a very short lecture, but I just wanted to wrap up some things with uh, Milton and then go on to Marvel and George Herbert. So let's just jump into number 12 here. And 12 is going to be um, interested in both some local descriptive issues as well as concern over the, the changing of the environment that's happening during this period. So this, I give you a photograph, a painting here to begin with. This is John Martin. It's a description, a painting of Paradise Lost coming after Milton by a good bit. But I, I offer it because in a way it sort of tr shows what Milton is transitioning into. First off, the big emphasis here again we've seen this with visual arts last time is on the environment human presence is very small and angels visiting adam and eve here but look at the environment here this is not a a kind inviting place the way you might think instead this is a very sublime forest and that's just a, it's a word we're going to talk about more with uh, with burke and emmanuel kant this notion that we'd like nature to be sort of wild and all that actually is going to be sort of introduced with milton in a big way and we'll just wrap up uh, saying a few things about Milton before going on to Marvel. And again, this is from Paradise Lost. Like Cooper's Hill, Paradise Lost is highly descriptive of a locale. In this case, the paradise itself, Eden. So, you know, you have groves whose trees wept odorous gums and bombed, others whose fruits burnished with gold rhyme hung amiable. Um, a lot of description here compared to earlier works like Virgil, um, even Johnson and Depenshurst written just you know 50 years before an awful lot of description going on we're seeing description taking off as a as a major uh, technique of writers and something interesting to think about of course is that this has to be the case because you cannot visit Eden and as a consequence it's a wonderful counterpoint to something like Depenshurst so Depenshurst or worked with Colcom too with Depenshurst Ben Johnson writes a poem, gives it to his patron, Robert Sidney. Robert Sidney lives on this country estate, so he doesn't need a whole lot of description, you know, when he walks around the estate, which presumably he would the way it's intended, carrying the poem. He just needs to have, you know, the mention that there are partridges here that make everything so beautiful, that there are, you know, trees that, that are, are wonderful. You don't really need a lot of description. Description would be counterproductive. You really want to experience the thing yourself. But increasingly, and especially by the time we get to the Romantic poets, you're going to be giving descriptions out to, to people who may never visit the place. You may never go to Grashmere in the Lake District to see the things that Wordsworth saw. So the poet actually has to, to sort of take on the job of describing the environment in such lush descriptive detail that you don't have to visit, you can just sort of imagine it. And Paradise Lost is a wonderful transition into this and a wonderful you know, bookend to to Penshurst because you can of course never visit Eden. So that being said, the job of the artist, Milton's job, is to describe it in so completely, so fully that you can imaginatively enter into that environment and experience it and see it in a way that um, is almost as good as actually being there. That's increasingly what the poet's going to have to do and you really need to do it with places that you just can't visit and Eden would be an example. Um, also, you know, you would need to do it the same, and Milton does in um, Paradise Lost with Heaven and Hell, because obviously you can't visit those these while still alive. And Milton, uh, it should also be noted that Milton wants to up the ante with his monism with the descriptions of Paradise, uh, Heaven and Hell and Paradise Lost. And what I mean by that is, it's one thing to say, as he, he does, and we talked about this last time, that, you know, all matter is one thing. It's, it's, it's you know, everything in heaven, on earth, and hell is composed of the same basic matter. Well, that's fine. But Milton wants to say, in, in like an Aristotelian 
fashion. It's not just the matter itself, but the form of the matter that is similar in these places. So, for example, hell and heaven and earth all have plants and streams and mountains and so forth. So it's not just that they're composed of the same matter. The matter is made into the same sorts of things. There's there's no difference here. It's um, it's not like a foreign terrain made of the same matter. So in theory, you know, Mars is made of much the same matter. Um, these Know, molecules as the rest of, as the uh, planet Earth, but it's a very very different terrain. It's very different. The matter is similar, but the way it's composed there is different than we would expect in some ways uh, from Earth. Milton wants to say, but you know, heaven and hell they're they're just like Earth. They're filled with the same sorts of things. Milton then makes an extraordinary statement. This is maybe one of his most outrageous. Um, interpretations of Christianity, and if you if you think about it, it may actually be a uh, an interpretation warranted by the biblical sources. Milton says at one point in Paradise Lost, Book Seven, that if Adam and Eve hadn't fallen and they had just continued to grow and the world had been perfect the way it was supposed to be, that Earth would have been changed to heaven and heaven would have been changed to Earth. If there hadn't been a fall there would have been a merging of heaven and earth together. So again, as a monist, it's not just that they're made of the same matter. It's not that the matter takes some of the same forms like trees and plants and all. They are so very similar that originally the plan was that they would have merged together and there would be no distinction whatsoever. That's a radical deconstruction of metaphysical dualism. So you remember way back in lecture five, we talked about how in metaphysical dualism, there's a split between the physical and the, and the metaphysical. And the problems that that in inherently brings with it. Milton doesn't believe that's inherent in Christianity at all, and he believes in a very sort of environmental way that the environment of the earth and the environment of heaven are fundamentally the same, should be the same, that there's absolutely no distinction between the two. So even if you would have said, well, okay, Milton, I believe in believe what you're saying as a monist, that it's all the same matter, but they're probably very different sort of places. Milton says, no, they look the same, same kind of things are there. They could have actually come together and been one place. Uh, that's the sort of the most radical revisiting of Christianity, I think, in these terms, and it's sort of complete destruction of metaphysical dualism. And it's, um, it's a very striking one, I think. So that ends our discussion of Paradise Lost. Um, moving on to Marvel, and for reasons unknown, I have his name here as John Marvel. Not the case. His name's Andrew Marvel. And uh, just as a little aside, Marvel was in fact a friend of Milton. Marvel was um, sort of connected up politically and when the monarchy was restored in 1660 when Charles I, who had been, headed, had been beheaded, when his son Charles II comes to power because Milton had been an especially vocal proponent of you know killing the king, um, it was... You you know, Charles II immediately sort of rounded up the people who were in that position and was preparing to execute them. Marvel, a friend of Milton, intervened in Milton's, um, on Milton's behalf, arguing Milton was pretty old at that time, he's blind, he wasn't very um, likely to be causing much more trouble, and in part because of Marvel's um, actions, Milton was not killed, which is a good thing for us because that was, of course, 1660. Milton's great works come after that period, Paradise Law first appears in 1667, the form we are familiar with, uh, published in 1674, and the great works of his maturity, Paradise Regained, and Samson Agonistes also come from this period. So thanks to Andrew Marvel for that. So we looked at Upon Appleton House. It's generally speaking the last country house poem. As I mentioned uh, before, country estate poem is a better way of thinking about these. In any event, there'll be others, similar things afterwards, like um, Alexander's Pope, Windsor Forest in the 18th century. But for the most part, country estate poems will be ending in this period because as description came on the scene as being more and more powerful, it no longer became necessary to visit the place you were describing. You then could describe any sort of environment you want, any sort of natural locale that you wanted. You didn't have to moor yourself to a particular place. But 
this particular poem, even though it's the end of this period, you can see how it's end of this genre of country estate poem, you can see how it's setting the stage for what's coming next. Again, 1652 uh, when it appears, just a decade after the first appearance of Cooper's Hill. And like Cooper's Hill, it's becoming more and more descriptive. It's nearly 800 lines in length. Description is now far more important than it was just a few decades before in De Penshurst, which is like one-sixth as long. So even though it's technically a country house, country estate poem, it's really transitioning into local descriptive literature as well. So it's an important poem to think about because of it's sort of a hybrid there. It's also highly allegorical. So uh, Marvel, who is a Protestant, is uh, again and again uh, has sort of a tirade against the Catholic Church, actually insinuates at one point that Catholic nuns are lesbians. He metaphorically weighs in on the Civil War. So in stances 47 through 59, allegorically, we see the king, represented by a little bird, beheaded. So I mention this because another interesting transitional aspect of a Pon Appleton house is it still has one foot in this older allegorical tradition. We saw this with pastoral, that it can be both allegorical more literal, even though the descriptions of the place are very literal and, and beautiful at times, it's still partly an allegorical work as well. This is going to sort of, that allegorical element of this type of highly descriptive nature writing is going to be falling away pretty soon. By the time we get to the beginning of the 19th century with the Romantic poets, not much allegory, and if it is, greatly overshadowed by the literal project of describing the natural world. Upon Appleton House expresses a number of perspectives on the environment. So again, it's a wonderful transitional text because some things that it says are sort of in a very modern vein, some are not so modern. So General Fairfax is Marvel's patron here. You remember that Robert Sidney was, you know, the patron of Ben Johnson at Penshurst. This time it's General Fairfax. Fairfax was an important character. He was a major general in the Civil War, and at this point in time, um, the king had been beheaded in 1649, and, and there's a four-year period where it's unsure who is going to rule the country, how that's going to work. Ultimately, Oliver Cromwell, who's another important general during the Civil War, emerges as the guy who runs the country for a while. But for a while, it was thought that Fairfax might do it. Marvel's living on the estate of Appleton House because he's a tutor for Fairfax's daughter. He has Fairfax's ear. He's trying to convince him to be the general who steps up and, and runs the country. But keep in mind that Fairfax is now, you know, he has retired to his country estate. He's sort of retired from politics, he's not doing anything. And what he really is doing, in a literal sense, is he's staying around the house gardening. And Marvel wants to draw attention to the fact that his talents are wasted on gardening. So you'd have a description here of of flowers, and notice that the notice all the sort of military descriptions. When in the east the morning ray hangs out the colors of the day, the the uh, the bee through these known alleys hums, beating with Diana's drum. So already beating with drum. So you have a bee, sort of like um, you know the the person in a military. Uh, um, you know, brigade going forth beating the drums first. The flowers then are being woken by this revelry that the um, the bee is beating. And the silken ensign, so ensign again a military term, each displays and dries its pan, yes, dank with dew, and fills its flask with odors new. So each of the flowers are filling their flasks. Now, of course, flasks are, you know, the, the um, in the military sense, would be what was filled with gunpowder in the flask fills the gun so the gun can you know then fire off these as their governor goes by in fragrant volleys they let fly so the image here is a strange one that the flowers have flowed their flask they're you know they're they're like they now have like loaded guns and as their governor goes by in fragrant volleys they let fly so basically they're giving him like a 21 gun salute they've all woken up you know there's been the morning at the, the beating of the drum all the military flowers have gotten up as the general walks by they all give a volley of not 
you know, shots into the air, but fly the odor coming out of them as they burst into the air. The notion here is, of course, that this guy, you know, Fairfax, his talents have been wasted out in the country, you know, being sort of the military commander of a garden. Instead, he should be returning to the business of being a real general and running the country. In any event, early environmental critics looked at instances like this and said, well, you know, this is really the same attitude that we saw emerging in Genesis, the idea that human beings had dominion over the planet. And here it plays out uh, in a very military way that, you know, we've lined up our plants in rows and we're growing them very carefully and controlling them. That's sort of the project of... Uh, of you know the West with respect to the environment, and really here it's sort of unmasked as being the sort of military project as well. Um, not everyone thinks that nowadays. There was an early sort of a knee-jerk environmental response. And the reason in part is because there are other scenes in this particular poem that tell a different story altogether. So after retiring from the flood, and again this is the central part of upon Appleton House where you have the metaphorical beheading of the king. You have a flood, the speaker t takes sanctuary in the wood, and while itself, and while at last myself embark in this green yet ever growing ark. That's a very famous line, maybe the most famous line from this poem, the green yet ever growing ark. And the idea here is that the the old growth forest is like the ark, like the biblical ark, Noah's ark, where everything is still there. All the animals are still there intact. And the first carpenter, this is Jesus, might have found um, fit timbers. So uh, this is an allusion to the fact that if you're building a boat, you need really large timbers. And you could find them in this forest as described, because it is an old growth forest. There's large, huge trees here. It's, it's, a, it's a place where everything is sort of harmonious. And and moreover, not only are there, you know, like in the ark, all the creatures there, where all creatures might have shares. Every animal has a place here in this forest. This is not um, a place that is controlled by human beings. Yes, earlier uh, we saw, you know, a flower garden controlled in a very military fashion, but here we have another part of the Appleton estate, which this part of it is going to increasingly become what interests poets. So when we move away, from descriptions of country estates, people are going to look for places like this forest, what we now would call wilderness. These will be the obsession of people in the Romantic era and the transcendental um, part of that in, in the United States, people like Thoreau and Wordsworth. They're going to want to see these places untouched by human hands. This is, this is wilderness. And here we're beginning to see a celebration of that. And this is not surprising from Marvel because Marvel talks about other things as well. Uh, and we'll see those in a minute that, that have environmental interest. So Upon Appleton House, a transitional text, right? It's transitioning away from being a country estate poem to local descriptive poetry. It's transitioning away from having, you know, sort of close military dominion over the natural world to a celebration of places where there there is no human intervention in the natural world. Um, if you looked at the passage I just described, you know, you could decide, you could very much call that ecocentric, you know, where each animal has its, its, its own share and where everything is allowed to have a place. That's not anthropocentric. The flower garden certainly is, but not here. So it's a, it's a mixed bag of things here, but you can see Marvel sort of pulling out of an older tradition and also pulling away from allegory and being more interested in literal. So a great poem to look at for shifting attitudes. And some of those newer attitudes pop up in, in Marvel's other poetry. So that's Upon Appleton House. Again, Andrew Marvel. So we also looked at mower poems, smaller poems written by Marvel. And there's an uneasiness that's emerging in England with respect to the built environment. It's going to continue to grow for the next 350 years. So I mentioned in passing before that in the year 1500, 
there were probably 200 new um, introduced species of plants in England. Everything else were indigenous species that have been there for a long time. So 200 new species. By the year 1700, that number grows to 20,000. The reason is England, you know, uh, um, is traveling all over the world now with their fleet. So it's not only the new, so-called new world, North and South America, it's Asia, it's Africa, it's everywhere, and other parts of Europe like Holland and all. So they're bringing all these plants back back and they're they're planting them and in the process pushing out indigenous species. This would be of concern to a number of people. Um, Andrew Marvel would be one and George Herbert who we'll look at in a moment is another one. So this is a description of a garden. Luxurious bring his vice and use did after him the world seduce, and from the fields the flowers and plants allure where nature was most plain and pure. So this description here first is that originally nature was plain and pure, and pure in the sense of untouched by human beings, not modified by human beings, plain in the sense that, you know, flowers are nice, but they're not going to be the sort of cultivated flowers that we would have expected to see. Then he, this is human beings, man, first enclosed within the garden square, a dead and standing pool of air. This is a description um, of what was been very common on country estates, um, which would have been enclosed gardens. Literally, gardens with um, walls around them, so that you could have had, you know, beautiful flowers in there. And Marvel finds this, you know, a dead and standing pool of air doesn't like this, doesn't like the idea that you're enclosing, enclosing it. And a more luscious earth for them did need was stupefied them while it fed. So what is this? This is actually a description of early composting practice, a more luscious earth for them were needed. So increasingly it's the case that gardeners and husbandmen more generally were knowing or learning that, you know, you could feed plants and make them grow extra large um, by giving them uh, um, nutrient-rich compost. And it stupefied them in the sense that, you know, um, nothing else is going to be growing around them or anything while it happens. Now this, of course, to us may seem like not a problematic practice at all environmentally. In fact, this is a description of organic gardening. Uh, but at the time, you know, when nature most plain and pure was able to grow things just fine, people like Marvel were wondering why human beings had to take a role in this process and sort of speed it along unnaturally. Um, again, you know, organic compost doesn't seem problematic to us, but to Marvel, this is sort of like using um, non-organic fertilizers, you know, the petroleum, nitrogen-rich fertilizers of the chemical industry. Marvel wonders why we really need to do that. Plants get along just fine without having us, you know, meddle with them. Um, the pink grew then as double as his mind, the nutriment did change the kind. So this, you know, nutrient-rich soil is gr um, causing flowers to sort of grow um, double in size and all. But more importantly, human beings are beginning to genetically, well, have, we've always been in the process of genetically modifying things, but to marvel the project is stepping, is, is becoming um, really worrisome. So with strange perfumes he did the rose of taint and flowers themselves were taught to paint. So what gardeners were doing was taking a, um, a typical plant like the rose and through selectively breeding it and crossbreeding it was causing the flowers to have different smells or to smell even more than they did before. Strange perfume. Suddenly, you know, a flower smells like something that it never smelled like before. There's no flower, quote, in nature before this genetic modification of selective breeding from people that were able to smell this way. And the flowers themselves were taught to paint. So, you know, roses might have, or, or any flower might have come in one or two colors as it naturally appears. By selectively breeding, we were able to bring a whole, you know, variety of different colors there. Most of what we're used to seeing today in florist shops, of course, are caused, you know, have been because of this project which has been going on for 400 years and longer. Marvel is finding this problematic, you know. Everything was fine. Nature was most plain and pure and now we're through these different processes. We're, we're you know, heavily laying on compost. We're feeding plants, making them grow larger than they ever could before. We're breeding characteristics, you know, smells and uh, colors that were never there before. Marvel finds this distressing. In the 17th century, this is sort of the equivalent of our concern over maybe hybrid uh, species, but 
more um, more commonly now, at least in the last few decades, genetically modified organisms. This is the same basic argument that will be made against GMOs in the 20th century, that we shouldn't be messing with nature, we should let nature be what it is. Marvel's saying the same thing here. This, of course, is what is going on in, Mil in Marvel's period. It is genetic modification, it is just doing so through selective breeding. So the poem continues, the tulip white for um, the tulip white did for complexion seek and learn to intertwine its cheek. So tulip is a great example. Introduced species coming from Holland and the Netherlands countries, it's taught to become white. So this was a great innovation in the time to actually create a, f a completely totally white tulip. This was something that breeders had been trying for for a while to interline its cheek with a slight color. Um, Marvel finds this, you know, what gardeners would have seen as sort of this, you know, the holy grail of their art, he finds especially problematic. And, you know, these pure white um, tulips would have been very, very expensive because they're, you know, it took a lot to do that. So it's onion root. Um, they then did so high did hold that one was for a meadow's hold. So the idea here is that, of course, tulips, you know, have bulbs that look like uh, an onion. So when he talks about the onion root, he means a tulip bulb. So if you are a breeder and you've created this perfect white tulip, you can obviously get a lot of money for that. And it's so valuable that one was for a meadow sold. So if you wanted to buy that, you'd have to sell a whole meadow on a number of acres of property, in which today I guess would get you, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars that you could then go ahead and buy this onion root, this bulb with a tulip. So they're very valuable, and he's worried about that. He's also worried that another world was searched. What's the other world? Another world, it's the new world. The new world was searched through oceans new, and through oceans we never knew were there before, to find the marvel of Peru. Um, again, he's talking about, you know, He's, he's actually referencing a specific plan here, but just the notion that, you know, all over the, the New World, North and South America, we searched to find these new and interesting plants which we brought back. He doesn't think this is very good, either genetically modifying or scouring the world for these new things. And yet, all this, these rarities might be allowed. That's you know, so everything he's just discussed, and that includes the the stanza that we looked at on the preceding screen where he's talking about teaching plants to paint and to smell differently. These might have been allowed to man, that sovereign thing and proud. So human beings are, and this is a reference to Genesis, of course, the sovereign thing, we're the ruler and proud. And this is referencing original sin, which is pride. It would have all been allowed had man not dealt between the bark and tree forbidden mixtures there to see. So this is a reference to grafting. Grafting had been around for thousands of years. In fact, there's references to it in the New Testament and all. But it's increasingly becoming a, a common practice and an important one from a husbandry point of view. And grafting, if you don't know, um, you probably do, of course, it's the idea that you can take um, from one tree or one plant, but usually a tree, you can take a branch, cut it off of that tree, grafted onto a new tree. So what you could do, for example, which is very common in this period, is they had huge old growth hedgerows. These are these huge hedges between um, farms. And uh, being older plants, they had this sort of old crab apple um, stock. These trees that produce these small, bitter, not quite inedible, but nearly so apples. Well, it was discovered by farmers that if you wanted to, you could take an apple branch from an apple tree that produced really good tasty apples and grafted onto those old growth um, uh, plants. Now of course those old growth plants had extensive root systems, they were you know they were firmly in ground, they were growing, you would take decades to get them to that degree. Suddenly then you could transform this hedgerow of non-usable older apple type into a, into a little orchard that produced you know usable and great apples. Farmers, of course, thought this was the this was the best idea going. Marvel is not so concerned. Had he not dealt between the bark and tree forbidden mixtures there to see. So what I just described would have been a forbidden mixture. You know, it would have suggested that the you know a branch would have been put onto another tree and made a mixture that was not never there before. So no plant now knew the stock from which it came. He grafts upon the wild, the tame. So this is my example. 
the wild you know hedgerow of trees the crab apple now has grafted on um, new branches the the tame apple has been grafted onto the wild and no plant now knew the stock from which it came well the plants now are thoroughly confused right i mean the the, the fruit itself the apple doesn't know where it comes from it's come from the branch of the the, the new uh, tame tree it has come from the older wild growth um, that the uncertain and adulterated fruit might put the palate in dispute. So everything is confused here. It's uncertain. It's an adulterated fruit. This is, in the 17th century, uh, thought of, not exactly, but pretty similarly to the way we would think of genetic modification today, GMOs. And here, Marvel has laid out a range of things that indicate that human beings are beginning to genetically modify plants in a way that had never happened before. At the same time, we're introducing new species to, uh, well, to England. So uh, the arguments that we will see emerge, that we'll see again and again, especially in the 20th century when they're sort of recreated and, and brought from here, is the same that you know human beings should not meddle with nature that nature is what it is and we should not attempt any genetic modification to it um, which of course is what we're doing today but as this poem which is 350 years ago indicates we've been doing this for a long time it, it's quaint to look back on it in a way to see the the you know the, the horridness of of using you know uh, organic compost or how horrible it is to graft onto a tree um, we think of those things as pretty benign now i think but at the time the, the the basic idea that human beings were modifying the environment and plants was um, was disturbing so that's um, one of Marvel's mower poems, again, Andrew Marvel. And I wanted to end with a little poem by George Herbert, 1633. It's coming a little before, but the poem, which is just entitled Man, um, no clue, I mean, no, uh, no surprise here that it's going to be anthropocentric. The title is Man. And he is also anxious about the loss of indigenous plants. So we just saw more of a sort of railing against why you shouldn't introduce these, you know, plants from Peru and Holland and with the problem. Marvel, coming a little before, a couple decades before, has his own take on things and he's especially concerned about the loss of indigenous plants. So more servants wait on man than he'll take notice of, and every path he treads down that which doth befriend him when sickness makes him pale and wane. O oh, mighty love! Herbs gladly cure our flesh because they find their acquaintance there. So what's going on here? More servants, and again this is uh, very much of the, the sort of um, language that we saw in Amelia Lanyard's description of Cookham, where it's very anthropocentrically all the plants are there to serve Margaret Clifford and they're happy to do so. There are more of these servants, more plant service, uh, servants waiting on men than he'll take notice of. You know, So we're not even aware of how these plants are there for us. And by the way, they're there for us in the sense that they are used by us. They're used, you know, for food and medicine and all, too. But there's so many of them, we don't take notice of it. And every path he treads down that which doth befriend him when sickness makes him pale and wane, O oh, mighty love. So what's going on here? We, in our path, and he means this not just um, in a literal sense of walking down a path, but in, in, our, in our path, in the path of civilization, as we develop it, we tread down that which doth befriend him when sickness makes him pale and wane. So these are plants, but specifically medicinal herbs. Down here he calls them herbs. These medicinal herbs befriend us when sickness makes him pale and wane. So when we get sick, we need uh, medicinal herbs, and at the time of course this would have been you know the only medicine that would have been known from herbs a lot of medicines are still made from herbs today plants today but we are in our path as we're developing the the world in this case developing england by getting rid of indigenous plants and bringing in new introduced species and actually monocultures because i mentioned 
Walter Raleigh would introduce the potato into England, Ireland, and elsewhere, um, it immediately became a, a, a monoculture in many places. People just thought it was, it, was, it was just great. Of course, that becomes a problem because whenever you introduce a monoculture, it's susceptible to the sort of diseases that, that would only just kill one or two plants in a, in a diversified garden. But if it's a monoculture, they can sweep through whole fields and countries, which it would a century after this, in a century and a half after after this in Ireland, the Irish potato famines are because of monoculture. But in any event, M Marvel, uh, Herbert is not so much concerned about the plants that are they're being introduced, but the plants that are being displaced uh, because of these new introduced, mono introduced uh, cultures and cultivars. And in this case, he's saying, well, you know, if we keep doing this, if we go ahead and, and destroy all the, the plants in our way as we, as we develop the land, both for houses, like we saw in Depenshurst or for new species like we saw in, in Marvel, then what would happen if we start killing the plants that we need, the medicinal herbs that we need? Who knows what's out there? We could be destroying things which will cure us when, when we really need them. It's interesting, you, you, you probably have heard this argument before, uh, three centuries later it gets marshaled for the preservation of the Amazonian rainforest, right? So also very you know, anthropocentric, you know, uh, just the way this poem by man is, but anthropocentric in the sense that the argument is marshaled, well, we can't cut down the Amazonian rainforest because who knows what plants are there. There could be plants there that could form the basis for cures for cancer, and, you know, we don't know it. There's so many species there that we're unaware of. This is just madness to go ahead and destroy it. That sounds like a, a modern argument. It's not. It's an early modern argument. You have the same. You have it introduced here with Marvel, that these herbs will gladly cure our flesh because they find their acquaintance there. This is actually a bit of um, 17th century. Uh, I don't know, pseudoscience, emerging science, or whatever, that the herbs found the their acquaintance there, that they were able to connect up with that part of our physiology that that matched their their constituent characteristics. But the idea is that he calls this mighty love, and that's a line that very well could have come out of Amelia Lanyard's The Description of Cookham, in that, you know, the, the plants are described as being anthropocentric, they're servants waiting on us, and that's just a glorious, loving thing that they do, that they heal us when we need to be healed. And um, we, of course, are treading them down and destroying them. So... With Marvel and Herbert together, you see this concern for changes to the environment. Um, this will continue for 350 years and more. The notion that on the one hand, we are heavily modifying the environment in ways that should be disturbing. And in Marvel's case, specifically, that we're genetically modifying plants, and this is very disturbing. We're also introducing new species. Herbert, of course, is going to see this as enormously problematic. These issues will return again and again over the centuries. Um, and it's interesting that they, they first emerge here uh, fully blown and, and rather well argued um, at a time when one small island, England, is beginning to experience, because it is a relatively small island, the issues that will ultimately become global issues as we begin to you know, lose indigenous species, introduce monocultures, and so forth. Okay, I promised it wouldn't be too long, so that's the end of lecture number 12.